My name is Christian Hernandez. I use she, her pronouns. I'm a proud member of DSA since uh, August of 2016, um, and I'm based in North Texas, uh, Dallas specifically. Um, DSA is the largest and fastest growing socialist organization in the country uh, with 60,000 plus members all over the country, super exciting. Um, I was elected to the National Political Committee, uh, the political le leadership of DSA, alongside um, Hannah, Abdullah, and Maikiko, who are also three other Socialist Majority members. And for those of you unfamiliar with Socialist Majority, uh, we are a caucus of DSA. Uh, we're working to transform DSA into a mass multiracial organization and grow the social force necessary for a Socialist Majority, both here in the US and abroad. Um, we recognize that we will not be able to build a socialist majority, however, without tackling white supremacy, imperialism, and other forms of oppression head on in society, um, in DSA, and in our coalitions. So we seek to consciously build bridges across these divisions while engaging in transformative campaigns. We want our work to be widely and deeply felt while bringing in and developing new leaders and securing material aims and material wins for the just economic and social uh, political system that we deserve. Now, I wanna briefly cover some community agreements to make sure tonight's event is enjoyable for all of us. Um, again, please respect the panelist and the facilitator, and of course each other. Uh, try to use the chat only when prompted. It can be a little <coughs> distracting while we're trying to talk. Um, so again, please use it as sparingly as possible. There will be time for questions at the end. Um, so we'll encourage people to use the chat there. Um, consider how you're showing up um, so we can uh, work across our race, gender, sexuality, and other social differences in ways that are supportive and make space for others. Um, stay on mute unless it's your turn to speak. Um, again, we'll have time at the end for questions. Um, keep your video on if you can. It's super helpful for active listening, um, but feel free to turn it off if you have to step away or if you're doing something a little distracting. Um, and then again, when you're asking questions, please be sure to use I statements. Um, if all of those things sound good, please hit that thumbs up reaction on Zoom or hold up your thumb, or you can type a thumbs up in the chat if you'd like, just so that we're all in, yes, I love it. I love seeing the little thumbs up reactions pop up. <laughs> I'm very easily impressed by technology. Um, <laughs> Well, uh, now I'm going to turn it over to Bianca Cunningham, a comrade who has been doing some great things in the labor movement and DSA, to introduce herself and our panelists tonight. Over to you, Bianca. Hi, everyone. Good evening. Um, my name is Bianca Cunningham. I am a former rank and file activist, uh, union activist with um, the CWA, Communication Workers of America. Um, I got my introduction into the labor movement by organizing my retail store, my, my retail store and seven others in Brooklyn, New York. We were the first ones to join the union on the Verizon Wireless side, um, kind of bargained the contract, went on strike, <laughs> the rest is kind of history. I'm so happy to be here with everyone tonight. Currently, um, I work for Labor Notes as a staff organizer um, and labor educator. Um, and I'm just so honored to be facilitating this conversation with all, with all of these great panelists who I'm going to introduce now. So our first panelist is Cecily Mayart Cruz. Um, Cecily is a teacher, activist, and the United Teachers of Los Angeles NEA Vice President. Cecily has taught for 25 years at both elementary and middle school levels, most recently at An Angeles Mesa Elementary. As a UTLA area leader, she has worked with schools, parents, and students, and the community to oust 23 bully principals. Cecily has collaborated with school communities in initiating the year-long boycott of district periodic assessments and protest of excessive testing of our students. She's no stranger to taking direct action, whether it's fighting against co-locations, demanding ethnic studies for our students, or declaring the end of the criminalization of youth, local and statewide lobbying efforts, as well as much more. Cecily has worked with school site leaders to build protests, community walks, and community forums that prevented school giveaways and included key stakeholder voices. As the UTLA NEA Vice President, she has engaged members worked with community partners to bring resources to schools like Honey Shine Inc., bringing a mentoring and self-esteem program for young girls of color. 
I also want to mention that Cecily is the first woman of color <laughs> elected to be in leadership of LA's largest teachers union. Um, it doesn't say that in her bio, but I would be remiss if I didn't uh, mention that. Welcome, Cecily. The next panelist is Bill Fletcher Jr. Bill Fletcher Jr. has been an activist since his teen years. Upon graduating from college, he went to work as a welder in a shipyard, thereby entering the labor movement. Over the years, he's been active in workplace and community struggles, as well as electoral campaigns. He has worked for several labor unions, in addition to serving as a senior staff person in the national AFL-CIO. Fletcher is the former president of Trans Africa Forum, a senior scholar with the Institute for Policy Studies, an editorial board member of blackcommentator.com, and in leadership of several other projects. Fletcher is the co-author with Pete Agard of The Indispensable Ally, Black Workers and the Formation of the Congress of Industrial Organizations, 1934 to 1941. It's also the co-author uh, along with Dr. Fernando Capasson of Solidarity Divided, The Crisis in Organized Labor and a New Path Toward Social Justice. And the author of They're Bankrupting Us and 20 Other Myths About Unions. And last but not, thank you, Bill, and welcome. And last but not least, we have Peter Olney. Peter Olney is the retired director of organizing for the International Longshore and Warehouse Union. Olney has been part of the labor movement for over 40 years. He has worked for numerous labor unions as an organizer and negotiator. Since coming to California in 1983, he has focused his work on building organization in the immigrant working class. From 2001 until 2004, Olney was the Associate Director of the University of California's Institute for Labor and Employment. Olney has a Master's in Business Administration from UCLA, and he resides in San Francisco, California. Welcome to all of our panelists. It's so great to have you here. So just want to get started with our first question, and our first question is for Cecily. So, I mean, I think one of the reasons why this conversation is so important um, that I feel like it's so important that we're going to have is because since, um, you know, for the last decade, since I've be first been uh, introduced to the labor movement, one of the things, key things that I hear a lot of labor leaders saying, um, and they're not part of the rank and file, oftentimes they are um, in leadership and like on staff or in the union offices, is that in order for labor to grow, because we've been shrinking um, pretty steadily in the last 30 years. In order for labor, the labor movement to grow and become stronger, we have to get to a model where we can start to build coalition with communities and fight for other issues that are outside of our bread and butter uh, union issues. Um, it's something that's really clear for uh, you know, leadership in a lot of instances. But then on the other side of that, I have phone calls all the time uh, with, with, with union members and staff and e-board members who are saying, we know that we need to prioritize racial justice. We, need, we know that we need to prioritize um, global, global, global solidarity, but we just can't convince other people that this is important enough to put it as a priority. And so I see these things, it's like, we know what we need to do, we know where we need to get if we're going to survive, but there's still such a, obstacle or attention with ha ha being able to push through that to get to where we need to be. So Cecily, my question is for you. You've been central in shaping racial justice work within UTLA and NEA, including as part of Black Lives Matter at school. Can you talk a bit about what that work has looked like? What advice would you give to union activists, parents, and students trying to do this work in their own schools and communities? Well, thank you very much, Bianca. It's good to see you and uh, the rest of the members and comrades here today. I'm happy to be here. Um, yeah, I think you kind of hit the, the basal points, right? That, you know, some folks are already just oriented or inoculated to talking about racial and social justice, but then there are some folks that are not. There are those folks that are inoculated, they are doing, you know, working with their own groups, right? But they're not situating that with the work of the union. And I think that is the biggest barrier or bridge obstacle to cross is to bring those people in to say, this is the work of the union. I think that when we are orienting ourselves around uh, really pushing a racial and social justice lens. Like that means every single thing we do in the union has to have that lens. And where it's not there, how do we get there? 
for us in UTLA, a big part of it was creating this racial and social justice committee. But as I take office in two months, I've been very uh, keen on telling staff and telling members and telling just rank and file folks that we are going to be taking a look at all of the work we're doing with a racial and social justice lens. That means tactical plans, convenings, every single thing we do has to have that tweak. Not only that, but it is critically important to bring in labor, community orgs, students, and parents into this work. I want to bring up the voice of the students because um, I think it's a part of lifting as we climb. Uh, a lot of people talk about uh, community demands or bargaining for the common good. We saw that in our strike in 2019 of January. A big part of one of the wins that we had were around community uh, bargaining for the common good. We took what, the, what was going on out in the streets, out with members, with parents and community orgs to really push something. One was ending this criminalization of youth, talking specifically about ending random searches, which we know are racist in its nature and they're not random. So the students have been laboring on pushing to end random searches and they were not getting across that threshold. We were able to bring that into the dynamics of our bargaining and actually win that piece on bargaining to end uh, random searches. So just that piece, our students said, wow, teaming up with the union, teaming up with Black Lives Matter LA, of which I'm a member, um, and really pushing a different type of narrative has really um, engaged our members and engaged our work. Um, I want to hit that we need to have a broad coalition of support, again, that centers uh, racial and social justice, and that creates that momentum in the movement of what we can do as we move forward. Um, we have to be able to press on in the fight, especially with unwilling members who only want to drive a bread and butter issues uh, narrative. That narrative is limited in scope, only gets you so far, and we know that, that we have to break that bound to say, look, it's going to be up to us, and we have to bring in all the voices to sit at the table. Because if we know if you're not sitting on the table, you're on the menu. So we have to do that. And we have to make sure that our parents and our students also have a seat that is right next to us, not behind us, right next to us. Thank you, Cecily. That's so helpful. And I hope that later we'll get to um, talk a little bit about how you all got to the point where you could organize around the unwilling members because that's no uh, small task. And um, I'm sure uh, people would be curious to know how that, uh, how you all got started and what the first steps were. So thank you. Um, the next question is for you, Bill. Um, some of your work has been with African workers' movements. Um, in the midst of this global crisis, how can US-based labor union activists and socialists respond and build international solidarity? And that question was to Bill. You're on um, mute in case. Um... Yeah, thank you. Um, a lot of what we have to do is um, revolves around narrative and it also revolves around the policies that uh, workers through their unions and independently push on the government. Uh, by narrative, I mean that um, in the current situation, there has been a major flare of xenophobia. So when we're looking at this COVID crisis, the cynical use of the terms Wuhan virus, China virus, the attempts by the administration 
to pin the responsibility on uh, China uh, and the flare up of anti-Asian racist violence in the United States is something that the labor movement broadly cannot take a pass on and needs to, both, uh, uh, need, needs to speak up on and needs to defend those who are attacked. And so the issue of the narrative, what is the source of this problem, not just the medical problem, which is directly related to the environmental catastrophe, but also the economic problem, uh, and the elements of which had been there for a while percolating and were going to lead, to lead to some sort of recession, but now possibly a depression. So we have to lay out a storyline. And this is really, uh, this is incredibly important because in the beginning of this uh, catastrophe, there, there has been, uh, there was a lot of understandable defensive arguments by unions in the United States about the first responders and the medical personnel that are facing, uh, uh, they're risking their lives. And that's all critically important. But the other part of it is that we have to explain to our members, as well as to the larger community, what really lies behind this. Because the problem, what I fear, is that we could end up through this crisis and people will draw their own conclusions. Uh, and one of the conclusions that we're being set up for right now is a, a variation on social Darwinism, that uh, the strong will survive and that the, the weak, the people of color, the older people are simply gonna have to sacrifice themselves on the altar of capitalism. Uh, and I think that the unions have to be speaking up about this and offering a counter narrative. Now, the second thing is in terms of actual policies, uh, internationalist policies. And, and I think that one part of that is uh, debt cancellation for uh, countries around the world in the global south that are struggling, uh, that do not have very well developed healthcare systems. Um, and, and so there needs to be union movement demands of debt, debt cancellation. And that may sound, that may have some months ago seemed idealistic. It no longer does because there's even people in the IMF, International Monetary Fund, that are suggesting that maybe something like that will have to happen. So we need to push the envelope uh, with our political representatives. We also have to make sure that there is aid that is provided. Uh, and uh, international cooperation. And these are all part of what I would suggest need to be the, the, the program of labor, not just the domestic program, but one that's looking international. And so we're looking at uh, the need for renewed cooperation in order to confront this virus. One of the things that's very interesting when you look at this crisis is that prior to the crisis, all of these different countries swore that if there was ever a pandemic, they would cooperate. And as soon as it started to spread, there was this major retrenchment. And it played into the hands of right-wing populist movements around the world with strengthening of borders, basically cover your ass, protect your kind, whoever your kind have to happen to be, and, and, uh, and an expansion of xenophobia not just in the United States. The question is who speaks against us, who fights against us? And, you know, I think it needs to be the labor movement. Yeah, thank you. Um, I remember at the Coalition of Black Trade Unionists uh, convention, being able to sit in one of the workshops put on by you and, Sol and folks at Solidarity Center to learn about the struggles um, was really informative for me. And it made me think like, wow, this should be happening way more often in our union halls and spaces. Um, and, I, and I think that once you present the information, it, there is like a natural common enemy and a natural mm -hmm. common uh, goal that we all have. And so really interested to dig more into that later. Thank, thank you so much, thank Bill. Thank you. All right, so Peter, um, you were recently elected to the Democratic Socialists of America's Labor Commission, congratulations. Um, so you've been a labor activist and organizer for 40 years. Um, 
What do you think about, what do you think will help to shape DSA's labor organizing strategy? Like what about this moment excites you about DSA and the, in the strategy that the DSLC and others are taking on? Thank you, Bianca. It's a pleasure to be on with this great panel. I remember handing leaflets to Bill Fletcher when he was coming out of work at the Four River Shipyard in Quincy, Massachusetts as a welder. So we go way back and Cecily, I already told her how much I admire the work of UTLA, an inspiring moment in labor history. Uh, yeah, this was kind of unexpected joining the steering committee, but it's proven to be a huge challenge and very exciting. I focused on two things. Uh, first of all, it's hard to know uh, what the movement is and where we're at as a socialist organization with 65,000 members if we don't have a good idea what's happening at the base and down in the chapter. So I've devoted a lot of my early time to this responsibility, mapping the work of DSA on the labor front. And so that, as you can imagine, is a very uneven situation. Some chapters here in San Francisco, the East Bay, Los Angeles have fairly developed labor work, needs to get better. And other chapters, we have about 21 chapters in California that are part of my world, have no labor work and are struggling to figure out how to do labor work and have very few comrades who are even in the labor movement. So we're really trying to model a program that takes some of the advanced experience in our chapters that are larger and have more resources to help promote labor work up and down the state. And we're learning some very interesting things um, about our members of DSA, how, how deep roots do they have in, in the labor movement? Often not. Uh, we discovered, for instance, that based on a national questionnaire of DSA members, there were only 86 DSAers nationwide in SEIU, either in a staff capacity or a member capacity. Now, I'm assured that their folks didn't respond to the questionnaires, but I found that astounding. And uh, so that's something to pay attention to. On the other hand, we find beautiful stories of work that's happening at the base. A Latino comrade in Long Beach is an aerospace engineer and attempted to organize a Japanese aerospace company into the International Association of Machinists. So if we dig down and get to our roots and look at the work we're doing, that provides us the basis to move forward. As Karl Marx said in, I think, 1875, he said, every step of real movement is more important than a dozen programs. So as we shape our work, we need to do a concrete analysis of concrete conditions. And that's the mapping function that we're carrying out now. The second passionate focus of my work, and I said this when I ran for this position, was Amazon and doing organizing at Amazon, salting Amazon, getting young comrades to go to work at Amazon, and building out a real network of working class organizing. And over my work with Folks over the last three or four years, we're actually seeing some of that work come to fruition in the person of Amazonians United and some of the actions that they've been able to take around the country in support of fight back against the COVID crisis, but also even prior to that crisis, winning, winning demands on the fulfillment center basis with this giant behemoth of a corporate enemy that we face in this time and place. So I'm happy to talk more about that, but uh, Amazon is my passion. Right now I'm working on two things, building the salting program and then working on a mentoring program where what we call elders will get to work with some of these young salts and some of the workers in Amazon. And Bill Fletcher, I'm going to be calling on you to be a mentor, so I hope you're ready to go again. Thank you. Thank you so much, Peter. That's exciting to hear. Um, I was just on another labor call for New York City DSA and uh, mentioning the members that we have that are uh, salting Amazon or working for Amazon and how that's been so um, instrumental and helpful in the organizing that needs to happen right now in this very moment to have uh, members there on the floor. So thank you for that. So this next section we're going to go to is the loose section. Um, I'm going to be asking questions or just putting things out there any of the three of you, Peter, Cecily, Bill, please feel free to um, respond in 
don't make me uh, <laughs> beg you, please. Um, okay, so let's get started. So um, in the past decade, we've seen unions begin to make common good demands the way that we were talking about earlier with you, Cecily, um, making, whether it's uh, Chicago Teachers Union, making demands around uh, affordable housing, climate change, LBT LGBTQ issues, or uh, racial justice issues like at UTLA. Teachers unions seem to be and have been leading the way on all of these fights. I just wonder, um, you know, one of the things that keeps striking me is like that the labor movement is not strong enough to win right now. We weren't prepared for this crisis, um, and we weren't, and we we weren't strong enough to even uh, help Bernie and support him in the way that you know we could have. So this question is for everyone. Um, I wonder what particularly or specifically that you think would be different right now if we had built real power in the labor movement. What would the demands look like? What would the movement look like? Um, what could be possible in this moment had we done the work that that deep work um, and that we were prepared for this moment? What does it look like? Uh, okay, I, I'll just jump on in. I'm, I'm sure that Peter and uh, Bill have, you know, a lot to to bring into play. But I really feel like if we had done the deep work that the other side is doing, has been doing for years and years, then we would have Bernie as the presidential nominee right now. Um, like let like we have to let that sink in into our consciousness to be able to say how do we then fight forward how do we take what we now know right which is not a really good alternative like we know that biden is not going to save us we know that right and how do we take that and start to push and demand the, the kind of world that I want to see for my son, the kind of world that I want to see for every single child that we talk about, especially educators? How do we move forward? Taking that moment of mourning and grief to turn it into actual righteous anger and action because that's what it's going to take for us to do and i said lift as we climb i really want to to bring that to fruition that we've got to have um white co-conspirators in this work i mean i have to like say that like we've got to have white co-conspirators because people can say they're an ally all day long but when it comes to my my things i don't want to deal with that right then i don't become as woke or as progressive as i need to be so i i want us to make sure that when we're talking about this type of world that we want to win this type of world that we should be able to win because there's many more of us in this struggle that some of those ideas that bernie was talking about are not so radical now when we're in a pandemic right that medicare for all that housing immigrant rights all of those things they're not so radical now so we've got to say this is what we were dealt with and sometimes it's a reflex motion to say, I'll let Bianca do it, I'll let Hannah do it, I'll let Peter do it, I'll let Bill do it. But it's gotta be like, I've gotta take on the ownership to this, to say, how am I now gonna ride on this so that we never have this kind of BS, bologna sandwich happen again? Like, how do we get that? How do we how do we move past that? So that's what I want to say because that is so important. I mean, I think that's a great point about yeah, like moving on from the morning and moving into action and finding real true what, what it really means to work together and struggle together. Um, but I think that oftentimes there's such a disconnect in what we're struggling for. Um, and so Peter, or I wonder if Peter or Bill want to add on to like, what, yeah, what would the demands look like if we really had built real power and, and, and what would be different in this moment? 
Well, the difficulty with the question, Bianca, is that it sort of depends on when you believe that the problem started. Uh, because if you basically are thinking about what we could have done in the last five years, it's sort of like being in a house that's infested with termites and a, the ceiling collapses and you're saying, damn, I wish I had fixed that ceiling. Well, but the problem was the termites. And if the termites have been eating at the house for years, then you could have fixed the ceiling and, and there was still would have been a collapse. Um, we are dealing with the ramifications of events that took place in the 1940s, not in the 1990s or the 1980s, but the 1940s. The passage of the Taft-Hartley Act, the um, Cold War, the purges of the left, um, the decision by the United Auto Workers to uh, essentially give up the fight for uh, social insurance, and other unions joining uh, forces with that, the decision of teachers' unions to basically take a model of the steel workers and attempt to implement that in major cities, um, you know, under Albert Shanker. I mean, we're living the legacy of this. So I think one of the first things is that we've got to be clear on our history. Um, because if you're not, you can end up making a series of, of very big mistakes. Uh, the, the second thing is that, so, so in, in some ways the question is, well, if we had turned the thing around in late 1940s, where would we be? I don't really want to answer that question. Uh, that gets us say, into kind of science fiction. But if, which I'm, I'm cool with, right? But um, if, if you're, if you're I, I think that the question is, in some ways, why did the reform movements that started in the 1990s in much of organized labor not result in more substantive change? And this is not exactly a question, but it's the question I'm going to answer uh, with all due respect. I think that the, that, that the answer lies in, to some extent in that the reforms in, the, uh, in organized labor did not understand, did not appreciate the depth of the problems. And there was also the weakness of the left. That if you look at the uh, high points in labor history, like in the first decade of the 20th century or in the 1930s and 40s, uh, there were lefts that were central and interfaced and helped to develop labor. By, by the 1990s, the left was weakened, and there were many people in, uh, that were very well-intentioned in the labor movement that thought that you could reform the movement without a left. And I think that that was a fallacy, uh, that there was a great deal of attention to tactics, but there was not the kind of attention to the development of the kind of internal organizations, and strategic organizing that was characteristic of the 1930s and 19, early 1940s. Um, and that put us in a real weak position. The final thing that put us in a very weak position was the, uh, in effect, abandonment of uh, worker education. So, so what you've had uh, beginning with the Cold War was a downplaying of uh, worker education, a fear of worker education because Worker education was identified as a hotbed for the left. And, and this, the narrowing of the parameters that led to a narrowing in the conception of trade unionism. So you put these things all together and where we are makes perfect sense. I don't mean that it's good. It just makes perfect sense because it's the outcome of both external repression and internal um, uh, collapse. Um, so now, had that not happened, I, I don't know. I mean, I think that the, um, the, the, the problem in, that labor had in approaching 2020 was, uh, first in terms of 2016, was this assumption that you really didn't need the opinion of workers in order for unions to make a decision about who to back. Now, after 2016 and the debacle, many unions recognized that, that that was a mistake, but they still did not pay a significant amount of attention 
to the kind of internal debate that we need, particularly if we're going to combat right-wing populism. I'll leave it for that. Thank you. Uh, Peter, did you want to add anything? Uh, now yeah, that I'll just rephrase the question yeah. in a better way for me. No, no, I'll, uh, I'll take off on Brother Bill's point around the weakness of the left. See, I look with some optimism to the recent period in terms of this Amazon work that I'm discussing. So if we look at the R Walmart campaign, which began in, in 2010, which was well-funded by the United Food and Commercial Workers to the tune of 20 million in the last year of the campaign. This was a campaign that relied heavily on social media and uh, public relations, uh, what they called a militant minority, but what ended up being strikes of two or three workers at stores of 300. And it ultimately failed. It, it, succeeded some in shaping a narrative around Walmart, but it was not a real worker organizing program. Bernie Sanders comes along, inspires a generation of young people to take up socialism uh, and take up the question of the working class. And now in the Amazon situation, which is an equally large and challenging company where we're dealing with a blank slate organizing situation, we have nothing in this company. We have no union base. And yet we have these young cadres who are working at Amazon and devoting their lives to organizing Amazon. And that combination of the left and labor is what ultimately is going to rebuild our base in this country. We cannot be a labor movement if we only represent 7% of the private sector. Uh, so this Amazon thing, it, it represents a change, a change in how we do organizing because we have socialist comrades working in those facilities. You cannot organize a, a corporate giant like Walmart or Amazon as a union without cadres. That's the story of the CIO. That will be the story of our own rebirth. Staying right there, Peter, on the, the, the point that you made that only 7% of the private sector uh, is unionized. You know, one of, the, one of the interesting things in being part of the socialist organization, DSA, um, I come out of labor before DSA, and I've been really struck by uh, the view of some of my comrades who, don't, who were critical about the rank and file strategy, but also critical about the focus on labor unions at all or workplace struggle at all um, because of this point that most people don't ha aren't, aren't organized in their workplaces. And so they see this as like kind of like a waste of time. Um, you know, we see different models like, uh, you know, worker centers um, emerging. Um, and, and sometimes I think that, you know, they, they don't replace, uh, they're not the same thing as labor unions. Sometimes they tend to be a lot more individual than I think collective um, in the struggles that they take on. But I wonder like, is, make somebody make the case for me why the labor movement as it like traditional labor unions and workplace uh, struggles should still be the ground zero of where we're struggling as socialists. Like why, I guess like, let's make the case to the naysayers about why this work is important that we're doing. Or will it look different? Will, will, will we have to abandon the traditional institutions of labor unions and look to something different? Um, you know, I, I want to go back on on that point, Bianca, but also on the point that that Bill raised around uh, the abandonment of worker education. And I think that is a key point, especially when we're talking about um, like the NEA or the AFT, right? So we have these big models, big structures, you know, union, labor unions, but have an unwillingness to fight, have an unwillingness to, to use uh, progressive ideas to push the envelope forward. And I, you know, and I can say that because UTLA is both NEA and AFT. So I see it in that way. And there's no shade on on any any person i'm just saying like the way i orient myself and being very progressive leading with a racial and social justice lens 
I am looking to see how we are tackling white supremacist culture. And when we don't like put it out there that there is this force of white supremacist culture and dominant narrative, then we just kind of fall back on, on things. Like, you know, look at where we are right now with NEA and AFT accepting or, you know, pushing through Biden as the uh, potential nominee, right? So I look at that and I'm saying like, I don't understand why. But then I say, I do understand because I'm playing with electoral politics as a frame, right? I'm just using that as a frame instead of saying, what do the members on the ground need? What do they need in this moment? How can they move in this moment? And, I, and it goes back to what Peter and Bill said, just the worker education. There is so much work to be done in the labor movement to get people to realize what happened in 2008, to talk about disaster capitalism, name it, and say, this is what's centering our work as um, you know, educators and health and human service professionals. So if we don't name it, we don't see the crisis in front of us, the only things that folks are left with is a frame to say, I've got to fight for my bread and butter issue. They cannot see the common good down the road because I haven't framed the choice for folks. And framing the choice means I am transparent. I'm saying it's disaster capitalism. I'm saying it's the shock doctrine. I'm saying that it's all of the redlining that happened and, and we can keep going on and on to the 13th Amendment, to a criminalization of black and brown people and Muslim and, and LGBTQ+, I mean, all of that. So folks need to have that frame in order to be able to push through and say, this is the fight we need right now. I want, I want to defer to Bill. Bill, do you want to comment first? Um, Bianca, restate the question. Making it hard for me, Bill. No. <laughs> um, what what question was I on? Oh, uh, I was talking about the conversation in DSA around like is the with only six percent of the private sector, uh, you know, part of traditional labor unions. A lot of people think it's a waste of time. Got it. To okay. Break strategy, etc. What do you? What's your take on this? Obviously, we're all in the labor movement. We believe in it, but like, let's make the case to why this is important and. And is there a way for us to kind of like revive um, this kind of dying institutions? So first of all, the labor movement is not the same thing as the trade union movement. Trade union movement is a subset. Labor movement refers to the sum total of worker organizations and movements that are fighting for justice and engage working class people. So, um, so that's one thing that we have to keep in mind. So that includes worker centers, it includes certain kinds of social clubs and cultural organizations, et cetera. The trade union movement remains a movement of millions of working class people, and it is organized. It has, as, as institutions, it has certain kinds of resources, and it is one of the few venues in the United States that brings people together across demographic lines. Um, this is a highly segregated society in terms of mu much of what people do. And the unions as institutions, irrespective of whether they're progressive or not, in particular cases, bring these different demographics together. Thus, there's a potential to bring about uh, various forms of class unity and class consciousness. To me, that makes it critically important. Uh, a, a second thing is that the, the union movement historically has been at its best an instrument to borrow from A. Philip Randolph for social uplift. And that that's the key premise of progressive unionism. And, and, and this notion of not simply raising the bargaining unit, 
not just simply raising our particular members, but raising the class. And so the, the, the trade union movement is that, is that that's, what, that's what its ultimate mission should be. That's one of the reasons I got involved in in the first place. Um, but it is not a panacea. And the problem is that particularly young leftists that get involved in the trade union movement, not as workers, but as staff, enter in and they have a lot of assumptions about the purity of the union, uh, about, uh, about why, uh, about the union, almost as if it's a socialist political party and not recognizing that unions are united fronts that have a variety of political tendencies there. Um, and, and some of those tendencies are outright reactionary, which is why we've got to be engaged in that struggle. Um, many of the people that uh, downplay working unions are people that actually are talking about downplaying the working class. It's not, I mean, they'll never admit that, but they basically are making the assumption that, that socialism is a movement that will be uh, brought about by enlightened uh, middle-class people and, and that the workers are not part of, they're not central to their own emancipation. Whereas I think if you look at the core cornerstones of socialist theory, it's very clear that the working class has to be itself the mechanism for its own emancipation. So I think that a socialist movement that is not paying attention to the working class is not a socialist movement. It's something else. And Peter, I'm going to let you uh, chime in. Uh, I just want to remind people quickly that we are taking questions from the participants. Um, so if you have a question, please type it in the chat. I see people have already started to do that. But um, just a reminder, go ahead, Peter. I'm sorry. Yeah, this point Bill makes about social uplift is, is really important. Unions can be instruments of that. Proper leadership history, that, that can happen. We saw that in 1994 in Los Angeles. Uh, Pete Wilson running, struggling to run for governor, authored a Proposition 187, which was as vicious as anything Donald Trump has proposed dealing with immigration. And there was a struggle inside the labor movement about how we should respond to this proposition. The Mexican community, the Latino community mobilized in the millions to oppose this, this uh, demonic uh, proposition. And the labor movement was split on this issue. Some argued that we have to cater to the Encino man, which means the Reagan Democrat living in the San Fernando Valley. And if we appear to be marching with Mexican guys on horses with sombreros, we're gonna lose those folks, Mexican flags, et cetera. A very creative white, trade unionist named David Sickler, who was the AFL-CIO regional director at the time, stood up in a meeting of unions and he said, if we don't march with these folks now, we're gonna lose a whole generation of immigrant workers. And therefore the labor movement marched with 100,000 members opposing Prop 187. 187. And that was a seminal moment that created the political circumstances that have changed the face of California politics. People forget that California in 1982 had a Republican governor, Republican legislature. The, the, the state's politics have been changed because of that Latino labor alliance and because of the vision and foresight of a white trade unionist. Thank you for that, Peter. So now we're gonna go into taking audience questions. Um, our first question comes from Sanjeev Gupta, um, I believe uh, a member from Massachusetts. Um, the question is, the proportion of adults employed in the US is now at a historic low, just about 50%. What does labor organizing look like in those conditions, union or otherwise? And that question's for anyone who wants to take it. Well, this is Peter. Uh, it looks like it has always looked. 92% <laughs> uh, of workers in this country get W-2s. As much as people on the coast think the gig economy is swarming over everything, we're still, we still have people working in manufacturing, the whole logistics chain that I talked about, California warehousing, 
8.7% of workers are considered temps or contract workers. The rest are proprietary employees of giant corporations. And it is our task to organize those people and build power among those workers. I'm going to um, add to, the, in, in agreement with Peter, but I'm going to add to a different angle. Um, we're in a moment when um, we need to be organizing unemployed workers. And, uh, you know, the, in, in 1930, uh, the Communist Party took a very bold step in, in establishing unemployed councils around the country. And this was uh, followed by work of socialists and people uh, uh, that followed uh, A.J. Musting. Um, and there was a, a, a legitimate unemployed movement that was established. And it was very complicated and it's been mythologized. Uh, and, and, you know, you would sometimes get the impression that these unemployed workers sort of organized themselves. And it, that didn't happen. They were organized by leftists who dedicated themselves to doing that. Um, we need in this moment, as we needed in 2009, but it basically didn't happen, a unemployed workers movement. And that needs to be a task of the left. It needs to be something that we push the unions to back. Uh, many of them will squawk and say, well, we're not gonna get any dues from these people. And, our response need, needs to be so to hell what. Um, but this is that moment. And one of the reasons it's especially important is that in moments of instability, social instability, there are two sectors that you want to organize. Otherwise, the right wing will. One is veterans, the other is the unemployed. And if you look at uh, post-World War I Italy, or if you look at Germany, the fascists paid an immense amount of attention to the unemployed and to the veterans uh, in Germany as well. And, and when I look at some of these uh, idiotic uh, right-wing demonstrations about opening the economy, and I see armed groups, uh, I think several things, some of which I'm not gonna say now, but what I will say now is we have to be out organizing these people because they're quite serious, they meaning the right. And that means we need to be speaking to people who are losing their jobs and losing their lives and say that there is another direction. And that direction is a, a left-wing direction, a progressive direction. And we need to convince the, labor, the organized labor to be central to that. All important, uh, yeah things to think about for sure. Um, thank you. The next question comes from Russ Weiss Irving um, from Boston DSA. Uh, the question is, a few national unions, UE, NNU, and uh, many, many progressive local unions across the country, thanks to Cecily and the UTLA, endorsed Bernie and helped build the Labor for Bernie network and organization to include 30,000 union members or excuse me, 30,000 union workers and built networks in many cities and states. What should happen next with this network and the various local and union specific networks that make it up? How do we make sure that we maintain and grow this trade union base uh, for Bernie's political agenda? Go ahead, Bill. <laughs> you were like, go ahead, Bill. Uh, we need to take over the movement. I mean, that's the bottom line. And, uh, and there needs to be a strategy for it. Uh, it's, not, it's not enough to just have good rhetoric, or for that matter, it's not enough to be backing this person or that person to head up the AFL-CIO. Um, we, we need to be thinking about what needs to be done to reshape this movement. So it's not so let me emphasize, it's not just about putting good people in high places. It's about transforming the movement in, in its fundamentals, transforming the expectations of members. Because many of us on the left act as if leaders are kind of up there and they make all of these decisions and that the members are like an audience in a tennis match watching the people play. 
the, the members are the social base. And if the members embrace business unionism, it doesn't ultimately matter what the leader does. If the members break with business unionism and are in favor of social justice unionism, then that becomes the base for the kind of insurrections that we need. And we need to transform the movement and its fundamentals. And that, and that means any, uh, all sorts of things. I mean, without naming names, I mean, we've got to get away from transactional alliances where you, know, you have unions that are able to develop community followings because people know that that union gives out money. I mean, we have to have legitimate uh, coalitions uh, that are uh, building, you know, mutual support, mutual solidarity. Um, we need to do what the Chicago Teachers Union has done and what UTLA has done, you know, in terms of making, uh, in their case, making the kids the central issue. And that, I mean, most unions are able to do that in one form or another. It may not be something directly like that. It might be uh, making the environment the issue. It may mean respecting the tribal rights of the First Nations. You know, when pipelines are being um, uh, crossing the country, even though that might mean in respecting the tribal rights, that our, our members may not end up getting those particular jobs. So we've got to transform the way we look at the unions. Move. And I think that that takes the spirit of the Sanders campaign and goes forward. I like that. Um, and I'm with that. And I think it's right on the money, Bill. Um, the key piece being transforming the expectations of members. Mm -hmm. And so we also have to deal with the apathy of members as well. Mm -hmm. um, the apathy and then uh, not having the appetite, like seeing it as a third party piece. Like the union can do that, but it's like, I'm the union. So what am I bringing to this fight? And that's why I was saying, like, we need to try to figure out how we fight forward. Um, I, I, I really would love for you, Bill, to, to name uh, this business unionism, because I think that is key bit between, because it's the framing of the choice, right? Got to get rid of the fear, uncertainty, and doubt. But naming what business unionism is, is instead of social justice unionism. So I think that um, should be very important for us to walk away from today. Um, we know transactional relationships never last, um, but that's the way big unions and, you know, NEA and AFT have done for years using transactional type of you give me this and I'll do this, that kind of stuff that doesn't build power on the ground. And when we are leading in a top-down fashion, we're not asking rank and filers, we're not asking the, the folks that are not engaged in the fight, why, why should you be in this fight? So that part, um, so definitely naming that fight so that everyone here on the call has marching orders to go back to their to their own union to say this is what we've got to do go ahead peter yeah i mean the sanders thing was hugely energizing for millions and one of the interesting phenomena from for instance 2015-16 it was probably replicated this cycle was that the largest group of unions to endorse Bernie Sanders, the largest number of local unions, was not the usual suspects of SEIU or you know, one of the teachers unions. It was the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, a craft union, a construction union. And I find that phenomenon extremely inter interesting because that re reflects a deep appeal of the Sanders message and the Sanders program in the working class. 
Now the question is, and I do a lot of work with building trades unions, is how do we take some of that consciousness around some of these economic issues and deal with the issue of immigration, which is a huge challenge for the construction unions, because the largest group, of course, of non-union construction workers are immigrants. Uh, Mex in New York, New Jersey alone, there's 125,000 Mexican construction workers. Um, and how do we more fundamentally deal with the age-old question of black workers in the building trades? And Bill and I go back to 1970 in the United Community Construction Workers in Boston fighting, physically fighting, to integrate job sites, taking over job sites so that black workers could get work. So here's a place where we need some real concrete organizing, challenging some of these issues around uh, race that both my co-panelists have talked about. And we got to get our hands dirty and go do that stuff. So I'm planning on rolling out a week-long training for these unions on how to organize immigrants. So that it's not an excuse anymore that they know how to do it and they should do it. But I also think we got to figure out how do we take on this issue of the African-American construction work? Because it's a huge, huge problem in our labor movement. Thank you for that, Peter. I remember uh, I had a meeting with the LA Black Worker Center and they were talking about their recent uh, victory with winning jobs for African-Americans on these work sites, but like the enforcement of it was so heavy. I mean, they talked about getting up at five o'clock in the morning, getting in cars and staking out outside the work sites to make sure that the, the quota of you know African-American workers was being fulfilled and met by these companies and how tedious it is to, to, to chase them around. So I appreciate your point about that. Um, we have time for some closing remarks. I want to wrap in one. Or excuse me, that we just didn't get to. So I wonder if uh, people can do closing remarks and then if you want to answer this question inside of your remarks, please feel free to do so. Um, I don't know who the question is from, but I'll read it. I recently participated in a webinar with DSA elected officials. One of our stars was on the panel, but what she said stuck with me and resonated with what Cecily has said. That a good number of people that she is working with in her district regarding COVID-19 relief don't know what a general strike is and are really not too knowledgeable about strikes in general. So exactly how do we go about educating our community um, if we want to have a successful general strike or any kind of strike for that matter, um, similar to what we saw in the years of the Great Depression? So if anybody wants to answer that, and I, I'll, uh, I guess we can start with closing remarks. Peter, if you want to start, that would be great. We can work backwards. Yeah, well, a general strike is a, is a beautiful thing. They haven't happened very often in our history. I'm most familiar, of course, with the 1934 general strike in San Francisco that led to the formation of the International Long Shore and Warehouse Union, a uh, strike precipitated by a maritime strike up and down the West Coast, and which resulted in the National Guard shooting two strikers in San Francisco and then the whole labor movement pouring out in support and shutting down the city and ultimately leading to a settlement that led to a sectoral bargaining agreement for the ILW on the West Coast. Those kind of strikes are extremely difficult to organize. I mean, the maritime strike in 1934 was preceded by 12 years of organizing on the waterfront, 12 years, and many unsuccessful attempts at local strikes that were beaten down and defeated. So again, back to my point of Reds better be ready to get into these workplaces and burrow in and salt and do some serious organizing before we can even think about strikes and general strikes, because you must have those kind of cadres to get to that, that point. Thank you. Um, okay, thank you. Um, it, it was great to be here with everyone, and uh, definitely with these two fine panelists um, and our moderator, of course. Um, so I think, you know, one of the things that we are doing as UTLA and uh, in California is actually gearing up all of the urban locals we have formed um, together. It's about 12 to 15 
uh, urban locals up and down the state to actually, in the name of the California Alliance for Community Schools, um, to really start doing coordinated bargaining. And with that, trying to line up all of our contracts together so that we could do something pretty massive. Um, for us, we went on strike in January and then Oakland went on strike in February. That wasn't an accident. We have been working together and with this group and the last two folks that had uh, contracts open were us and Oakland. So that happened. Um, now with these other locals, especially because of the COVID situation, we've been doing much more planning and much more organizing together so that we could get to a crisis point probably in 21 or 22, where all of our contracts are lined up so that up and down the state, we could hold an actual strike, not in name only, but actually feet to the fire out. So we know that that's what it's going to take, because if we're able to do that, we can bring on other locals within California to be able to do that. But people's mind and imagination has to be opened around this. That's why it goes back to really naming the fight, really naming how we can be transformational in our thoughts, building on the ground so that we actually build power. So that's what we are working on now and looking at a national view, what we are doing is working with CTU and several other locals to actually list what demands look like when we reopen. What demands look like, what does it mean to be a transformational union? What does it mean to be taking over the narrative, that part? So we are working not only statewide, but actually nationally to try to drive something um, really deep that can really shape the labor movement. Oh, I just got goosebumps. Thank you, Sister Cecily. Thank you so much. Um, lastly, Bill, take us home. Um, well, thank you again. Uh, labor needs to be the leading force in the current situation and the fight back that's necessary in response to the COVID-19 uh, economic and economic crises. Um, and in order for that to happen, uh, the union movement particularly is going to have to convince other uh, social justice movements and the organizations within them that our interests are long-term as opposed to tactical, that we're interested in building a broad front um, and we're interested in winning. We're interested in advancing an agenda of working people, whether they happen to be in our union or not. And, uh, and as I was saying before, that necessitates a different kind of leadership and indeed a different kind of membership. That is a different consciousness about what trade unionism is about. And as Cecily was pointing out, uh, breaking from the sort of narrow idea of the union as a third party, uh, the union protecting wages, hours, and working conditions for the people who are lucky enough to, be to have a collective bargaining agreement, and instead having a broader social justice consciousness. Um, there have been times when that has happened in US history. Um, and to this question about general strikes, the last general strike, to my knowledge, was in 1946, and it was in Oakland. And what happened in 1947? The passage of the Taft-Hartley Act that uh, brought, uh, brought on immense repression and restrictions on what workers could do. The union movement made a decision in the face of that and in the face of the Cold War anti-communism to essentially cave in and, that, and concluded that nothing could be done, which is why we should be very careful when people talk these days about a general strike, since most of us have never been in a general strike, it's rhetoric. You know, and, and the thing about the idea of calling for a general strike is this. One thing I can tell you from history, if you call a general strike and people don't show up, you can't say, oops, 
uh, why don't we reschedule this for next week when more people show up? Um, you, if you miscalculate, you not only lose, but you lose badly. And you enhance the strength of the other side that comes sweeping in with a, with a, a curved sword and just slice and dice. So we've got to just understand, as Peter was saying, this is like a long-term thing. And, and final point, I had the opportunity of meeting Harry Bridges in 1985, uh, the founding leader of the uh, ILWU. Um, and before it became the ILWU, it was the West Coast uh, ILA. And what Peter was saying, I just want to double emphasize, it wasn't just that they were organizing for 12 years, they were organizing for 12 years under vicious conditions, not where people were using harsh language against them, but where people would be drowned. Organizers would be drowned. You know, people would get whacked for organizing. I mean, and it was incredible repression. And what helped was the existence of cadre within that. People from the CP, people from other groups that were making an ideological commitment to organizing workers. They weren't doing this just to collect a salary, but they were doing it because they believed in it, because they believed that was necessary to fundamentally transform the United States. We need that kind of spirit today. Thank you so much, Bill. And thank you for reiterating the point about the commitment, the ideological commitment. I know that I've heard workers go into SALT and say, well, I'm going to, my plan is to be here for a year and see what happens. Well, you're not going to turn around your workplace in a year. This is truly a long-term project. Um, Cecily didn't mention it, but building up to your strike, what did y'all do? Four years, four years of building a caucus, four years of a plan. So people should be really serious about this. We should be buckled in. This is a long haul. This is a lifetime commitment. Um, and with that, I just want to thank everybody for being part of this conversation. It's been so heavy and dark to be in these times, but finding ways to connect with comrades have really uh, brought me through personally. So I just want to say thank you to everyone. And with that, I'll pass it back to Christian. All right, y'all. Uh, we are a little out of time, a little over time, but thank you so much to our panelists, Cecily, Bill, and Peter for sharing your insight. Totally agree, the Reds have to be ready. Um, I know after, after listening to all of your, uh, your, your feedback and your observations, um, I think it's really clear that we have a lot of work to do, um, but I'm really excited to be in a space uh, with a bunch of other comrades who are committed to this fight or you know, through this conversation, maybe recommitting to the deeper fight and the longer fight ahead. Um, again, um, thank you all for joining us. This event was put on by Socialist Majority, a caucus of DSA. Um, you can learn more about us, read our blog, apply to join by visiting socialistmajority.com. Um, and for those of you not in DSA yet, you can check us out at dsausa.org slash join. Um, and if you enjoyed tonight's discussion, be sure to follow us on social media to get the details for our next event on June 11th. We hope to see you then. Everyone, please stay safe, stay well, take care of yourselves and each other, uh, and good night. Thank you. <laughs>